Alrighty, I took yesterday off, and um, it's good that I did because the news didn't break until very late after I would have already recorded anyway, that uh, <laughs> indeed the Fed and the Treasury um, are coming together to bail out the depositors of Silicon Valley Bank, uh, Signature Bank, uh, which that one crashed uh, or uh, on Sunday. So I don't think I've even spoke to you since uh, Saint Signature went under. Of course, we had Silvergate the week before, uh, and uh, it seems that today uh, we have First Republic. So now, to be clear, First Republic is not in receivership yet, but there did seem to be uh, a run on First Republic this weekend. There were people lining up. Uh, to pull their money out, you know, even physically, not just digitally. You don't need to have physical bank runs. People don't need to go and line up at the bank to pull their money out. A lot of them, uh, especially the big account holders, the people who actually matter, um, the ones with uninsured accounts, they, I'm sure they do it electronically. I, I don't think that, um, uh, you know, BuzzFeed was standing at the counter at Silicon Valley Bank trying to get their money out. Or less doesn't matter because they've all been bailed out and so now the FDIC implicitly um, I guess it insures all deposits no matter how large they are there's no longer a cap the cap used to be a hundred thousand then they raised it to 250,000 in 2008 uh, and now you know everyone says oh well 250,000 that's ridiculous it's like okay well yeah because we've had lots and lots of inflation so 250,000 you know can't even buy you uh, a crappy fixer-upper so I guess we're just going to insure all deposits in the entire um, banking system, and um, there is really no reason to have private banks at that point if there's no risk of losing your money. Um, I mean, it's just at that point 100% privatized profits and socialized losses because you can't actually insure uh, the entire banking system. That's not insurance at that point. That's just single-payer banking. So undoubtedly, um, this Fed backstop um, would have tapered down on the bank runs to the uh, that would have gone on today. So uh, all else equal, there would have been a worse situation today had the Fed not intervened in this way. But at the same time, the Fed doing this fixes nothing and, in fact, only makes the situation worse. Uh, having the 250000 um, insurance cap already created a moral hazard because it basically said that if you, know, if you have less than $250,000 in a bank, uh, there's no risk there. And so that incentivized people uh, to put their money in uh, any bank, no matter how risky it was. Um, you just pick whichever one has the, will offer you the highest um, uh, rate on your savings. But now we've got the moral hazard that uh, everyone, including you know massive uh, billion-dollar companies, uh, they are going to have their deposits insured uh, no matter how high they go. And so who has to bail out the depositors when these banks go belly up? Well, of course, it's all it's the rest of us because they're just going to inflate our money away. Uh, they are going to redistribute money from poor people uh, to massive uh, multi-billion dollar tech firms by inflating the value and devaluing our money to make them whole. Just like 2008, what we're witnessing is a massive redistribution of wealth uh, from um, the poorest Americans to the richest Americans. Now, the question is, will this be the end? Um, you know, we were able to go today without another bank failure. First Republic is still standing. So far, it's, well, Silvergate was first, and it voluntarily is closing its doors, so it's not being shut down. Um, Silicon Valley was shut down, um, by the FDIC, and then Signature was shut down by the FDIC. So since we've gone now one day uh, without a bank closure, does that mean that we're, that we're out of it? Does that mean that everything's gonna be okay? 
No, things are just as bad as they were yesterday. Um, the fact that we saw two, uh, two massive bank failures in one weekend um, is just evidence of how fundamentally uh, unstable our financial system is. Um, and as anyone who has studied fractional reserve banking knows, it is an inherently unstable system, always has been. It's never a question of uh, why is this happening? We know why this is happening. This is happening because of fractional reserve banking. Why is it happening now is always the question. Because this can happen at any time. All people have to do is pull their money out of the bank and the banks are done. They can't do anything about it. Um, because the banks borrow short and lend long. If the banks wanted to be solvent, uh, they would borrow long and lend short. <laughs> A solvent bank um, would take out, uh, would like, let's say, issue a 10-year bond or something or a five-year bond. Okay, they would have investors who would buy their bonds and loan them money um, that didn't need to be paid back for, you know, five or 10 years. And then a smart bank would uh, lend that money out for terms less than five or 10 years, less than whatever the, the term of the bond is. Um, and so that way they could pay back uh, their liabilities um, you know, with their assets. But instead, uh, the bank takes out what are essentially overnight loans, demand deposits. Um, they take out, they go into debt with their depositors. Um, and that debt, that note can be called at any time. And the bank has to cough up the money. And so what does the bank do with that money while they have it, knowing that at any time somebody could show up and demand all their money out? Well, of course, the bank uh, lends it out for 30 years. And so uh, then we have the famous scene from that terrible, awful, no good movie, It's a Wonderful Life, where Jimmy Stewart gets on the counter and he says, your, your money's your money's right here. It's in, it's in uh, Billy's house. And it's in, and it's in, uh, uh, it's in Mary's store, and it's in, uh, it's in Farmer John's wheat field. That's where your money is. And so the bank never has your money. Um, but this only gets exposed when people have some reason why they need to pull their money out. And so things go great for the bank as long as people don't ask for their money back, because the bank gets all this money given it to them, given to them, and then the bank can lend it out and collect interest. But you see, there's this thing called interest rate risk. And since we have interest rates in this country that are arbitrarily determined by a Politburo known as the Federal Reserve Board, um, those rates can change at any time based on the whims of a man named Jerome Powell. And so these banks, um, their assets on their balance sheet are uh, it's a bunch of long-term debt, long-term bonds, uh, mortgage-backed securities, whatnot. Very boring instruments, but uh, nonetheless, interest rate sensitive instruments. And they bought a lot of these, you know, when interest rates were very, very low. And then guess what happened? The Fed started raising interest rates and all these bonds that they had um, that are long dated, you know, 10 year bonds, um, all of a sudden were, were worth uh, way under the face value. They're way in the red on all these bonds unless they hold them to maturity um, because uh, who is going to pay full price for a, let's say, a $10,000 uh, $10, bond uh, paying, let's say, 2.5% uh, a year when you can go out and, you know, get one today uh, for that's paying 4%? Obviously, you would go out and get the 4% bond um, over the 2.5% bond. So the only way that you're going to sell a 2.5% bond is at a discount. Uh, that takes into account that uh, that difference in interest. And no one would do this if, unless they absolutely had to uh, because uh, you, if you paid full price for it, you don't want to sell your asset at a loss. But what had started happening was um, because they're not making a lot in interest, uh, Silicon Valley Bank and these other banks uh, were not raising the... Um, 
the interest rate that they're paying depositors as the rate on everything else is going up. So the depositors are going, well, hey, why am I have my money in a savings account when I can go buy treasuries and make 4%? And so the depositors were withdrawing their money and going and buying stuff like treasuries. Well, then the bank screwed because then the bank has to sell those treasuries in order to try and get cash to give to their depositors. And as soon as it was revealed that uh, they were selling assets at a loss, well, then it was clear, hey, the bank's in trouble and everybody goes to try and pull their money out while they still can. And so Silicon Valley Bank, in my opinion, is not unique in this respect. This is the position that all the banks are in because all the banks uh, were, you know, had loans out outstanding um, assets that are low yielding. Everything was low yielding until the last year. It's only been this last year that we saw a big rise in interest rates because the Fed jacked up interest rates, which I think they should have done um, for this precise reason to pop the bubble. Well, this is what popping the bubble looks like. It's driving the banks out of business. Now, in the wake of this, already yields are plummeting, um, which is going to take some pressure off of the withdrawals from these banks because it, you know, it lowers the differential between what you're making in your savings account and what you could make you know, with a treasury bond. And so the banks want to crush yields. They want the Fed to come out and um, make some dovish statement uh, that implies that they're going to cut rates at the next, at the next meeting which very well might happen. I would not be shocked at all if the Fed cut rates at the next meeting. Now, what are the odds this is all over? Um, to me, it seems pretty low, but you know, then again, I, I always go back to, you know, I have, I have uh, PTSD from the last time I thought it was all over. I thought it was all over in late 2018, 2019. People who have listened to this channel for a long time, um, particularly if you listen back then, uh, you've heard me talk about this over and over again. I was wrong then. Um, now, I wouldn't have been wrong had the Fed not done what it did, but again, I have to leave open the possibility the Fed will do something extraordinary uh, that will, um, you know, surprise me and kick the can down the road for another couple of years. Here we are, you know, four years later, um, you know, early 2019, that was four years ago, and uh, here we are in another crisis. You know, for now, what we're hearing is that this is just a regional bank problem, that uh, the national banks, you know, the big banks are are flush with cash and, you know, this could never happen to them. But, I mean, do we even believe that? I mean, look, the stock markets are not, <laughs> they're not crashing. They're acting like the party's still going. And so maybe that's just what we have. We have a little blip. We have a quick bailout. And then it's uh, four more years of party time. So with that said, um, I will see you folks back here tomorrow.